Good morning, and welcome to the Second Baptist Church of Amarillo. We'd like to invite you and your family to come worship with us and be a part of our services this Sunday morning at 1040 in our worship center located at 419 North Buchanan. Our Wednesday evening services begin at 6.15 p.m. Join us now for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So let's look at this, Joshua chapter 5, starting in verse 1. So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were on the sea or by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourselves and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who had came out of Egypt, who were males, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who had come out had been circumcised, but all of the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people who were men of war who had come out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had swore to their fathers that he would give them a land flowing with milk and honey. Then Joshua circumcised the sons whom he, he being God, raised up in their place. and They were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. Verse 8, so it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their place in the camp till they were healed. And then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal, and they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate, and they, they ate the produce of the land. And on that day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna. And they were all saying, praise the Lord. But then they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. They had just crossed over the Jordan River to enter Canaan. They had been waiting for this. They had been dreaming for this. They had been looking forward to this. And in fact, for 40 years, the children of Israel had been waiting to claim the inheritance that God had promised to give to Abraham and his descendants. It was in Genesis chapter 13, verse 14, that this promise was made. And this is what it says, And the Lord said to Abram, After Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as dust on the earth, so that if a man could count the number of dust on the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise and walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. What an awesome promise. And it was, it was this promise that was passed down from each generation. From generation to generation, this same thing was passed down. It went down to Isaac in Genesis chapter 26 and 3. It went to Jacob then in Genesis 28 for 13. It went to Joseph after that in Genesis 50 and 24. And then it went to Moses in Exodus 6, verses 6 through 8. And then to Joshua here in Joshua 1, 6, where God said... Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Now this is the promise. This is what had been going on all through these generations. And now their wandering days were over. They had finally arrived. The day of possessing the land had finally arrived there. God intended for Israel to conquer the land of Canaan and to possess it once and for all. 
Amen. So, here they are. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Israel has arrived at last in the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. Now, what happens next? Let's look at our outline. Number one, God's power respected. Joshua 5.1 says this, So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were, on, or by, were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer. Why? Because of the children of Israel. How exciting is that? Here it is, that the enemy, listen to me, the enemy believes the unbelievable. And doesn't that encourage us as God's children to believe the unbelievable? To believe the impossible? Because with our God, nothing is impossible. That's the way that our God works. You see, uh, they had heard about the Red Sea, and they remembered Rahab. You remember her from Joshua chapter 2, verse 10. She said this, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone. That was the scenario. You see, but now not only had they heard of the Red Sea, now they had heard of the Jordan River too. And this was just hitting a little too close to home. This was literally in their front, your, uh, front yard, as it were. And uh, it, it's one thing to see these Israelites, but, but it's quite another thing to see them plus the mighty works of their God and what he had done. It was more than they could handle. Uh, this meant destruction. Their courage failed. Their hearts melted. Uh, their strength left them. There was no more spirit in them any longer. What that means is, is God came in and he took their breath away. It's as if they, they saw what was happening. Surely they were able to look down those seven or eight miles down from the hill and they saw the Jordan down there and they saw that the Jordan being a mile wide began to open up. It began to back up and they saw all of those millions of Israelites coming across that river and it was at that time that their hearts began to melt within them. It was as if they looked, and it says that God took their breath away. There was no more spirit within them. And it's as if they looked and they went, <gasps> and they couldn't get another breath because of what God, because of what Yahweh, because of what the Lord Jesus Christ was doing in their midst. Oh, how exciting. What a time. Now, uh, just because we see them frozen in fear, uh, don't think for a second that these were small or frail men. They were not. On the contrary, remember the spies' report back in Numbers 13? Uh, those ten fearful, foolish, and faithless spies back in verse 28 of Numbers 13. It says, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. In other words, guys, there's giants there and we're afraid. I don't think we ought to go. Well, let me ask you this morning, how many times does the enemy whisper to you how big he is and how tough he is and how he's going to huff and how he's going to puff and how he's going to blow your house down? And he tries to control us with fear. But I am here to tell you this morning, our God is bigger. That is what our God can do. You see, now the shoe is on the other foot. The Amorites and the Canaanites, they're the ones who are now filled with fear at the prospect of facing these Israelites, and not just these Israelites, these Israelites and their God. And I am telling you today, we are in a spiritual war, and the enemy is not afraid of us, but I'm telling you what, when we get alongside the Lord Jesus Christ, and we go out and we do battle for our community and for Amarillo, the enemy will back up because he not only sees us, he sees us and our living God. And that's what God desires to do in and through us. It is because of this that their feet were literally shaking in their, with their sandals. Why? Because they knew this, that if the river had been crossed, the city had been lost. 
There was nothing impossible for this God. And that is what was going on. And so now with all of this fear in the hearts of the enemy, it seems that uh, this would be probably the perfect time for Joshua to attack. In our, in our minds, we think, man, they're shaking and they're quaking and they're not going to do anything. Let's go. And sometimes God says, wait. Oh, man. How many of y'all love to wait? How many of y'all love to wait on the Lord? I mean, waiting for your wife is one thing. Bless you, dear. But waiting on the Lord, sometimes that takes longer than getting ready for dinner. And sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's difficult, but God is always doing something in the background. We don't always see it. We don't always understand it. But then later we do. And we go, oh, God, thank you. You ever been there? God, thank you for making me wait. Thank you for preparing me more. Thank you for dealing with my heart. Thank you for getting that out of my life. So that you can have your perfect and pleasing way, your perfect and pleasing will within me and through me. And instead, God commands them to remain at Gilgal <laughs> for several things. First, and on the surface, they appeared to be very strange, as we just read. And even appear that the things that, that are required of them that he was asking them to do may in fact actually put them at risk before their enemies. Uh, but while the ways of the Lord may appear strange to you and I, and they do at times, let me remind you that the ways of the Lord are not our ways. His ways are above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 say that. You see, God never gets in a hurry. You ever notice that? Man, I don't like it. You can ask my wife, sometimes Larry gets in a hurry. And unfortunately, sometimes when Larry gets in a hurry, then he gets impatient, and then, and then she gets to see Larry and not Christ. And that's not fair to them. Sometimes, sometimes we need to, to realize and understand that God truly is in control. He truly is sovereign. He truly has everything worked out in his timetable. He's not in a hurry, and he has the liberty to take his time and do things on his schedule. And while the things that happen in this chapter, they appear strange, they, they seem different and difficult at the backdrop of this impending battle, uh, but the truth of the matter is, God simply is preparing his army to fight. And I want to tell you, no matter what stage you're in, God is desiring to prepare you to fight. Why? Oh, we all know. We all know that life is not easy. We know that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but, I be, but about every principality and power in high places. We have an enemy. We have a foe. But I am telling you, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. And God has that victory for us. So what are God's ways? Well, let's look at that, number two. God's covenant restored. Uh, we see that there in, in 2 through 9. But for the sake of time, just remember these verses uh, from our reading earlier. Let me just take your attention to 7 and 8. Then Joshua circumcised their sons whom he had raised up in their place. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And so it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they had stayed in their place in their camp until they were healed. You see, before Israel takes one more step into their new journey, into this promised land, uh, there's a small concern uh, to, that we need to take care of, namely restoring the covenant. That's what needs to take place here. Therefore, the first command that the Lord gives Israel at this time is for all the men to be circumcised. Uh, evidently, all the men who came out of Egypt were circumcised according to the demands of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, that already took place. However, uh, those men who were born during the 40 years of the wilderness wandering had not been circumcised. You see, uh, the, Israels, the Israelites that, that entered Canaan were not the same Israelites that exited Egypt. We have this new generation, this new group, if you will. And therefore, this new generation, they submitted themselves to this painful surgery. But why? We beg the question, why? If we don't, we don't read a lot of history and we don't understand this, understand it this morning. This was to restore their covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We must remember that Israel is a covenant nation, a privilege that God gave to no other nation. 
Uh, he, he had sealed this covenant with the sacrifice according to uh, Genesis chapter 17, 11. It says this, And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. God gave circumcision as a sign of the covenant to Abraham and all of his descendants. Warren Wearsby says this about it. Through this ritual, uh, the Jews became a marked people uh, because they belonged to the true and living God. This meant uh, that they were under the obligation to obey him. Uh, the mark of the covenant reminded them that their bodies belonged to the Lord and they were not to be used for sinful purposes. Israel was surrounded by nations that worshipped idols and included in their worship rituals that were sensual and degrading. The mark of the covenant reminded the Jews that they were a special people, a separated people, a holy nation, and they were to maintain and remain in purity in their marriage and in their society and, most importantly, in their worship to God. Just like this morning when we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, I'm telling you, I almost lost it a couple of times. If that didn't get your fire going, my friend, your wick is wet. We worship the Lord this morning. Well, I should say this. I worshiped the Lord this morning. And I'm so thankful to be able to do that in his house with you. Now, you see, uh, this is not hygienic a measure, uh, but in fact a spiritual marker. For the Jew, this meant that he was actually a part of the people of God. God had chose him. God rules over him. God took responsibility for him. He claimed him as his own. And let me just ask you a question, and I'll go fast. Are you claimed by God? Do you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ? And so, with this new generation, a new start was established right there in Gilgal. The covenant was restored. Now, for us, a similar truth is at work. According to Colossians 2, verse 11, we have been circumcised in the heart. Now, the scripture talks about it in lots of different places. I chose this because it was very clear. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. That's where we say amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you, that you allowed me to come to you and be yours. Brothers and sisters, this happened for you and I when we were joined to Jesus. At that, that instant of our conversion, that is what took place. Dear Christian, I want you to know today that if you have given your heart to the Savior, the Savior has done heart surgery on you. He says that he takes out our heart of stone and he gives us a heart of flesh. You see, when you got saved, you got sealed. And when the circumcision was over, we read in verse 9 this, Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, and therefore the name of the place is called Gilgal, to this day. The name Gilgal actually means to be rolled or to be rolled away, and there's the name. And in fact, this term, reproach of Egypt, it brings to mind two events during Israel's wilderness wandering. Let me just bring them to your attention. The first is found in Exodus 32 when the children of Israel made a golden calf and they worshiped that golden calf as God. All right? The second was in Numbers 14 when the children of Israel they displayed their unbelief and they refused to enter into the promised land. Uh, the reproach refers to the sins of the people that was in their heart and in their very life. That's what this reproach was all about. Uh, this is so important because, listen to me, on both occasions, as we go back, the Lord threatened to destroy the nation of Israel on both of these accounts and start over fresh with Moses. That's what happened in both of those. And yet, both times, Moses, being the good leader that he is, Moses intercedes with the Lord. 
and he reminds him that destroying Israel would give the Egyptians a reason to mock God. And he didn't want to see that. Now, God knows everything, and God knew it. And, and he also knew the heart of Moses, who would go before the children of Israel. He said that they would say that he brought them out of Egypt, but he couldn't bring them into Canaan. But guess what? Now they're in the land. They made it. Praise the Lord. He was able to open up that Red Sea. He was able to open up that Jordan. And he was able to usher his children into their promised possession. What promised possession are you waiting for today? Because I want to tell you, God is able. He is able. God has proven that he's more than able to bring his people into their promised land. Therefore, he tells them that the reproach has been rolled away. Now, unfortunately, many people, many of God's children, are still living under a reproach today. Now, you may be living with the shame of things that you've done before uh, you came to faith in Christ. You may be ashamed of times that you've failed the Lord since you've been saved. There may be guilt over some issue that's uh, going on in your present life right now. There may be guilt of some issue that uh, you've been trying to hide away. Some of you are, are living under the constant stab of self-condemnation right now. Now, if that's you this morning, uh, I want you to do yourself a favor and write down these verses. We don't have time to read them all, so just write them down. They're going to be up on the screen in just a moment. And, and I want you to meditate upon these, these things. And if you have questions about these verses, please come find me, sit down with me, schedule a time where we can look at these in detail. We don't have time to read them, but here they are. Psalm 103.12, Romans 8.1, Isaiah 38.17, Isaiah 43.25. These are important verses. Jeremiah 50 and verse 20, Micah chapter 7.19, 1 John 1 7. You can leave that up for just a moment. Now, there's many more that I could give you, but, but if you understand and you apply the truth of these verses to your life by faith, if you're lost, you're going to walk away saved, and you're going to walk away with a clean slate, and you're going to walk away with no sin, and listen to me, you're going to walk away with no shame. Because that is the power of my God. Now, let's look lastly. God's provision received. And you can see that in verse 10 and through 12, and you can read that later. In these last verses, we see that they partake of the Passover, and the manna is cut from the menu. And again, I believe that those Israelites were praising God about no more manna. How many of you get sick of what you're eating from week to week? Can you imagine some 38, 40 years of manna and manna and manna and manna? See, just as you're getting tired of me saying that, they were getting tired of eating it, all right? So, so here they are. It's cut from the menu. Let me just mention a couple of thoughts before we close. Here we find Israel. They're celebrating the Feast of Passover. They first observed this when they were still in Egypt back in Exodus 9. This was a memorial meal, if you were. They, were. they were celebrating that night that the death angel swept through the whole land of Egypt and killed the, the firstborn son from every family. What a night that was. Now, that is, unless uh, you had taken a spotless lamb and killed it, and you dipped a hyssop branch into the blood, and you sprinkled it on your doorpost, above and below, and to the right and to the left, if you were to do that, then when the death angel came through that awful night, and he saw the blood, he passed over that home and left all alive. Aren't you glad of that? Why did he do that? Because God had promised in Exodus 12, 13. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over. They also celebrated it at Mount Sinai before they had left Kadesh Barnea back in Numbers chapter 9. However, after that, there's no evidence in Scripture that they had celebrated the Passover in nearly 40 years. Hmm. Well, that seems strange to us. It seems kind of weird, but the reality is, in fact, they couldn't celebrate the Passover. 
Why? The new generation had not been circumcised, and that was one of the requirements to participate in the Passover. And you see, uh, the same is today for us when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. If you're not a believer in Christ and followed Him in, in baptism, you've not met the requirements to participate. Why? Because you're not covered by the blood. You see, my dear friends, uh, you have nothing to celebrate. You go, Larry, that's, that's pretty harsh. I want to tell you the truth this morning. If you've not been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, if you've not been born again, you have nothing to celebrate. But I want to tell you, Maybe I'll be the first guy. Maybe you're on TV and you've never heard this before. Maybe you're out there in, in the World Wide Web. Listen to me. Jesus Christ made a way. Woo! Hallelujah! He made a way. Did you not know what it says in Matthew 26, 28? For this is my blood of the new covenant. You and I were in a covenant with Jesus Christ. We're in a new covenant that we understand from the New Testament. And there's what it says, for this is my blood in the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, that he was willing to look at me and still die on a cross. He was still willing to shed his blood for me when he knew every sin that I would ever commit when he was hanging there. What I want to tell you is that you can come today you can be saved today. By faith, you can trust in his sacrifice and receive salvation today. Today, you can begin walking in the promised land. You can begin walking in the promises of God. You can begin walking in his forgiveness. You can begin walking in his grace. You can begin walking in his mercy that he makes brand new every single day for Larry and for you. Are you ready to enter your Canaan? Let me ask you a few questions, and then we'll, and then we'll close. You see, if, if not, if you're not ready to enter your Canaan, then you just simply need to do whatever God's telling you to do. Now, some of us, we may need to come before the Lord and remove anything from our life that's not pleasing to Him that doesn't belong there. God will speak to your heart. You know what it is. You know what's in there. Some of us need to rely upon Him and Him alone. I know there's sometimes we can rely on friends, we can rely on family, we can rely on money, we can rely on others, we can rely on our church, and thank God we can, but there comes a place where we must get to that we understand that it will be God and God alone who will sustain us through those difficult times that my brother is going through. It will be those difficult times when we can only turn to the Lord at 3 o'clock in the morning when we're still awake with tears in our eyes. It is being with Him and Him alone when we're going through the difficulties of life that no one else can help with except Almighty God. Some of us need to release our past and refuse the burden of carrying it any longer. And some need to come to Jesus Christ by faith so that you can be saved from your sin. Thank you for being a part of the worship services of the Second Baptist Church of Amarillo. If today's sermon has touched your life in any way, there are counselors waiting to receive your call at the number on your screen. For out-of-town viewers, please call the toll-free number at 1-800-366-1737. Thank you, and may God continually bless you and your family.